That song was called Streetwise, and that's off my solo album, Protocol. Again, this uses a drum machine rhythm in the main verse, and this is the same rhythm slowed down. And here is that rhythm, a little bit faster. This next pattern, which we're going to slow down for you, is, is what I'm playing during Ray's solo. It's very difficult to slow down a pattern that feels, you, you, I just play it as we're playing along, and then I have to think, ah, oh, slow it down, and all the little beats start to come to life. And you actually start thinking a lot more about what you're playing. But of course, once you take it out of that tempo, it do, it's not, doesn't really mean a lot. So you will notice, I'll probably put in some other things to make it work at that tempo. Uh, it's just something that naturally happens. But it gives you an idea of really what's happening. The idea really with the two hi-hats. Again, streetwise, when I wrote that, I was just getting into using two hi-hats. So I really wanted to create rhythms that really use them. Stereo hi-hats, one out there, one out of that side. Here it is, up to speed. Snare drum tuning. I tend to tune my snare drums fairly tightly. I like to feel the response of the head. I don't enjoy playing on a drum where the head is not tight. So what I've got to try and do is retain the tightness but also get the depth out of the drum. I use these heads with a little spot underneath, really just for reinforcing. If I could get away with a, a straight white head, I would use it. But the way I play, the sticks I use, a little bit heavy-handed sometimes. So these just last a little bit longer. And underneath, I, I'm still trying to figure out actually which I prefer, whether I prefer a regular ambassador snare head or the ultra thin diplomat. Some drums, and I'm talking about just the same size, some drums sound better with the diplomat head, some sound better with the ambassador. I sort of go through phases, and one minute I think, oh no, this is it, I've found it. And then, you know, a few months later, I get to another drum and it's got an ambassador head, and I think, ah, oh, gee, no, this is much better. It's one of those things of sort of constantly changing your ideas. Uh, I never, I, I like to, you know, have a set thing that I do, but I never feel that that's it. There's always room for a bit of a change. Um, the most important thing for me 
in a snare drum, which basically makes it work or not work, is the snare bed. And I, when I look at the drum, I like to see a nice little curve underneath that makes the snares keep in contact with the bottom head. If I've got a flat spot in the middle, that drum's just not going to work for me, and I have to have the snare bed recut. Um, I actually like to, to, to go pretty wild with the snare bed. I remember once I was rehearsing in New York, and I had a guy there recut some uh, shells, some eight-inch shells. He had, to do them th uh, he had to do them three times before I was happy. And uh, those two drums I used on the Who tour, and they sounded absolutely wonderful. So to me, um, it's very important that, that that snare bed is working. It means then I don't have to tension the snares that tightly. Again, I think people are, are amazed at how loose really they are. And as long as it's tuned correctly, and as long as the rest of the kit is tuned okay, you're not going to get a problem with snare buzz. It's, it takes, you know, it takes a few years to figure that one out, and I'm still, you know, I still get baffled. Why doesn't this snare drum, you know? But that's part of the whole thing of drumming. My approach to practicing snare drum, or practice in general, is not to go hell for leather and be as quick as you can. I actually like to practice quite slowly and concentrate on the accuracy. I found that if you spend a little time just being very, very accurate, very, very even, the speed will start to come because the control is much greater. I think it's good to push yourself occasionally as well, but to warm up, it's very good to just take it relaxed, take it very evenly. Well, I'm going to just take you through some exercises which I do just to warm up, to practice a little bit, just some ideas. The first one is single stroke roll. Okay. So basically I'm just going to start out just very, very comfortably, very easy. Then a little bit quicker. A little bit quicker. A little bit quicker. Then the next thing would be a double stroke roll. Two beats on each. Again, very comfortably. And then with the left hand leading. A bit quicker. Next one will be triple stroke, three strokes each. And a bit quicker. A bit quicker. Four stroke. A bit quicker. A 
Then I'd introduce another magic little rudiment called a paradiddle. Um, let's just define the three different paradiddles. Single, sticking is like this. Double paradiddle. And a triple paradiddle. The way I like to play these are two singles, two doubles, and two triples. It's, uh, the paradiddle is, is a wonderful rudiment because basically whatever your right hand does, your left hand has to do. And I think going through the single, the double, and the triple is a really good exercise. The other thing which is really fun is that when you play that pattern, it actually works out that it's in 9-4 which sort of makes it a bit more interesting rather than just sort of going through the motions. So, I'll, here it is, I'll play it. The 9 4 bit comes in like this. I'm going to do a great big one at the end of the pattern. The next pattern I would practice is probably some triplets hand to hand, so I would start off leading with the right, then leading with the left, like this. Now, once I've got all those together, one of the things I like to do is basically just get the sticks going. And I then pass through all these different variations. Single stroke, double stroke, triple stroke, four stroke, the paradiddles, the triplets. But keeping the same tempo as even as possible and also even in terms of volume. I think it's actually a very, very good way to, to, get, to gain control. And again, it doesn't have to be hell for leather fast. You can just take it quite comfortably and slowly build up that speed. Here goes. If you watch very carefully, you'll see the sticking change from single, double, triple, full stroke, etc. The other thing that I'd like to do, which I find very helpful, and it sort of stops me getting bogged down playing one particular way, is I like to use fingers. And the way I play essentially is a finger style technique. It's not the wrists that really do all the work, it is the fingers. So to emphasize that point or to practice, I actually play a little bit with fingers. Now, it's important to get the snare drum at the right angle for this. 
otherwise it's very, very uncomfortable. So what I do is take the snare drum, turn it around that way, and then just play single strokes with the fingers.
That song was called Harlem Nights. This is a style which probably not many people have heard me play, but I do enjoy playing this style, this really fast uh, jazz rhythm, whatever you want to call it. The main points about playing this song, again, is the obligatory big ears, to be able to hear what Anthony's doing, to be able to hear what Ray's doing, to be able to hear all the keyboard parts, and also supporting the soloist, being free to be able to go where he's going to go, but also locking in with the bass player and being very musical about it. I think this sort of playing really gives a big opportunity for that. You can be very, very fluid. Every time you play it, it's different, uh, which, is, which is great fun. The first rhythm I want to demonstrate is 7-4. These pieces of music I've written really as guidelines. They're really just to demonstrate how to play a certain rhythm. When I'm confronted with a piece of music that's in an odd time, I listen to it, I listen to the demo, whatever that's been brought along to the, the recording session, and I try to pick out the most salient points of the rhythm. Which beats are the bass playing? Which beats did the piano play, or whatever the instrumentation is? I try to pick out the most important beats, the beats that I think are important to pick out. And then really build up the rhythm from there. This 7-4 thing, again, is I utilize the octobans and the gong drum, and I try to make it a, a pattern that repeats with a fast hi-hat rhythm, which remains constant. This next rhythm I want to play is a 5-4 rhythm. This is a, a, a more mellow piece of music. Uh, I think it's good to demonstrate different styles as well. They don't all have to be just sort of like, you know, charged up, high energy pieces. This is pretty relaxed, but it's in the odd time signature.
might have noticed during that 5-4 section, there's a little bit in there where I um, do a real fast snare drum hi-hat rhythm. This is that rhythm dissected a little bit. I start off at tempo and then just come right down so you can see exactly what I'm playing and then build it right up. Now for a bit of madness. Just for fun, I've concocted a piece of music that's in 33-8. Um, you'll have to take my word for it. The, the first time I heard a piece of music like this was on an old Don Ellis album. And thankfully, they explained the breakdown of this rhythm on the liner notes of the album cover. And really, all it is is a subdivision of threes and twos. Now, I took that rhythm, or rather, I took the time signature and made up a slightly different rhythm. The subdivisions are different, but they're still twos and threes. And you see at the beginning, I actually beat this out using the two hi-hats. But one bar of 33 is, is, is quite long. It takes quite a long time to play it. And uh, this, again, shows how you can play a complicated rhythm but also have a real pattern to it, some real form, which is a lot of my approach to playing, especially playing these type of things. I do look at it a little bit as though you're programming a drum machine. How would you get a drum machine to play like this? And it's a way for me to play an odd time signature, a crazy one, but not for it to, to be almost, it's, it's actually very understandable because of the way the pattern works. Again, using octobans, using the gong drum. And of course, I, I uh, attempt to solo over it and um, my mind sort of has to keep switching a little bit. I don't really count. I never count when I play a time signature. It's purely feel, but it just takes a little while to, to feel the pulse and where to make the, the odd move, which you wouldn't make if you were playing in full four.
I'd like to finish this section on odd time signatures with a piece in, I think, my favorite time, which is 6-8. The great thing about this is you can play so many rhythms. You can play a shuffle, you can play a sort of very slow backbeat rhythm, you can play 6-8, you can play a 4 across it, and do all sorts of things. And that's really what I'm going to demonstrate in this piece. It starts off with a, a, a sort of, uh, I don't know what you call it, a, a more of a, an African beat, really, with the octobans and the hi-hat. And then it goes into a, a shuffly backbeat rhythm, real slow. Uh, play a little bit of the song. And then it goes into the, the section where I go through the changes. I start playing in 6-8. Then I start playing in a, more of a shuffle, double bass drums, um, eventually ending up in a, a three across four type rhythm where I'm playing like a, a rock rhythm, but it's going right across the six eight, but it fits perfectly in there. And then just simmering down, going back to the African rhythm.
This next song we're about to play is going to be Protocol. This uses, again, the two hi-hats in a, in a different way. The drum kit operates, occupies a different space. The treatment is more from a Latin point of view rather than heavy kit playing. It then progresses on to octobans, little snare, few tom-toms, and until we get to the end where the whole kit's going wild, double bass drums, cymbals, toms, everything. The key word to this is dynamics. It starts tiny and just gets huge at the end. But on its way to the end, it gets huge in the middle and then comes right down. Um, it's real textural from that point of view, and it's fitting a sort of rock drum kit or rock attitude to a very more, more Latin, more dynamic approach. All the little sections are worked out, but hopefully put together with a lot of fluidity. Here is a breakdown of the, the first rhythm, the hi-hat rhythm. And here it is up to speed. This next section is the octoban rhythm, the Latin section, really. This utilizes octobans, the little, little snare, the smallest tom-tom, bit of hi-hat, bit of bass drum, slowly building up to the middle section. speed. In the, uh, what I call the sneaky sections, you, you'll know which bit that is, I really, really get polyrhythmic and in especially the second time we get to the uh, sneaky section, um, I go right across it. Ray and Anthony are playing, they're playing their parts, the sequencer, all the gamelan instruments are playing away. And I've made a sudden left turn, I'm playing a different rhythm across it. But it's nice, it, it fits and it works out and comes out at the end. And then we just start to build and just gets bigger and bigger until the end. I'm going to close this tape now with protocol. <laughs> 